What's something funny that we could attach to the beginning of this video? What fun stuff has been happening? Oh, let's see. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> okay, let's move on into the show. <laughs> what do you say? I think we're, we're pretty clear that fun stuff hasn't really been going down. Ass kicking, busting our asses, problem solving. That's what we're up to. Okay. We're, we're getting back on the horse, guys. Here with us. Here comes Manny. Manny, you coming in to join us? Manolo. Come on. Anyways, okay. So, uh, let me just jump into a couple uh, real quick things. Manny, you just come jump into some carpet and some sleeping. Um, hey, buddy boy. I don't think, can they see him? Yes. Yeah. Hi, man. He's all clean. Doesn't have his collar on. He's like... He's in the lap of luxury. You've been yes. spoiling the crap out of him. That's not true. Just a little, well, a little Just bit. as much as... A little bit. Okay, anyways, we're going to try and jam through this. We've got a lot more questions than usual um, because there were a shit ton of questions, so I'm going to really try and jam through it. New collars and leashes. Uh, if you saw the post, if you didn't, go find it. Um, we've got... I was going to say paracord, but it's not. We've got biothane leashes. Um almost finished uh, we've got a black version right now that is kind of our prototype it's looking super cool um, it's got all the same gadgets and safety features that our other safety leashes our tgd ultimate leashes have on them um, but just a different texture some folks prefer it um, easy to clean uh, so we got the biothane happening and colors will be coming uh, down the line, you know, I'm sure we'll probably duplicate the same colors we've got. And maybe, then... maybe also like purple and green have been highly requested. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But I mean, at least we got to get the foundational yes. fa foundational colors happening. The foundation. Yes, please. And then, do you want to talk to them at all about the? Uh, I, I don't even want to call them Martin Gale collars because they're really not. Martin Gale collars are a very specific thing, and our collars are something different. I guess Martin Gales are mainly about having, so you know, like how choke chains go all the way. Mm -hmm. So Martin Gales basically have a stop at mm -hmm. some point. Uh -huh. So I guess that's like the mechanics of a Martin Gale that they don't. And it the comes from two away. points rather than a choke chain coming from through a loop and one point. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. like a slip lead would, but it's still as quick as a slip lead would be, or a dominant dog, or mm -hmm. even a choke chain, mm -hmm. where your classic martingales with the big loop overhead are not very quick because they get like hindered. Like let's say most of the time they roll down the neck mm -hmm. because they, if they don't fit it properly or because the ring is too heavy, mm -hmm. then it just like slides. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to deliver a correction or anything like that for whatever reason you need at that moment, instead of going to the side or from the top where your leash would be, mm -hmm. if you walk or do something, it takes time to move it around and then actually deliver something. Right, 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 right. So those are nicely fitted at the top where the strap comes out from the side and it's like a, like a slip lead mechanism because it stays right in that spot, basically, right, but it has right. a stop like a martingale. Right. right. And, and it easily contracts, but also yes. easily uh, relaxes very and goes easily. back to its, its, its original position. Quick. And then, of course, as you guys have seen, if you've watched the videos, we've been super cautious, super careful, and really working hard to get the um, the D rings, whether mm -hmm. they're paracord, whether they're metal. And we've got a whole bunch of controversy mm -hmm. going on which one's going to be which, um, where they're um, either sewn down to where they don't stick up, mm -hmm. um, or the paracord's very tiny, and then the actual. The, the mechanism, the way that the uh, our non-Martingale collars work, um, 
doesn't create this big loop mm -hmm. that stands out. Somebody actually mentioned today, which was funny but not funny. Um, they were talking about with Martin Gale collars how it droops down, and yes. their dog would take it and then bite it and chew it and mm -hmm. then like devour it, except for the metal pieces. Yeah. So, and then we have the questions about do we do over the head mm -hmm. and no buckles? A lot of folks want that. Do we do buckles that are metal? Some folks are wanting that. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're always going to have a million different. Uh, so we already we already had we were thinking about the the cobra ones in the very beginning. Remember? Yeah. yeah. So we already went through that part of the hardware, um, Which where was we the metal. The metal, yes, right, the right. Met, the metal. Because so what we found is a lot of like people on tactical gear use them, and they're great because they release easily. They're like lightweight and they yep. can take a lot of toll like pull easy on them easy to connect disconnect yes. yeah but yeah. they are also easy to accidentally um, undo yeah. and that's the problem right so then we personally i prefer the the ones with the buckle mm -hmm. but i think we will offer both anyway because okay. now you're talking about e-collars though e-collar straps no martingales that you buckle our Martin goes with the buckle with the plastic yeah, buckle. Yeah, but weren't weren't the uh, weren't the tactical ones built technically? Yes, they were, yes, they were the e-collar e ones. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So just to be they, clear, they also do normal like flat buckles okay, with the cobra. I've only, I've only those seen thick the, ones that I've they only, hold on to the dogs. Yeah, I've, yes. only, I've only seen the e-collar ones. Yeah, so okay. I think we will do both anyway. The overhead ones because we can still do the exact same mechanism. Right. We just instead of sewing in a buckle, we just sew it together. Exactly. Um. Or, and we would do the, the, the quick release buckle and the buckle we chose is super heavy duty. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. It's like, it takes a lot of force to actually press the little knobs mm -hmm. to undo it. Yeah, yeah. There's like Should no way. Should be super safe. Yeah. Then the other questions, and I'll try and jam through this. Some folks are asking about uh, the uh, reflective mm -hmm. um, um, thread in them. Um, whether that's going to be a really valuable aspect. Some folks, of course, were like, could you put that in the leash? And we had tried that initially. I can't remember what, what was the reason why we said no to... Because it wouldn't like do well with the, the way they are sewn together. It, it wasn't as sturdy, if I remember right, something like that. Something right? about the stitching that just made it like not work quite well. Okay. And just wouldn't look quite right because... The, the the fabric that we use we couldn't find nylon in those colors in that kind of like sturdiness heavy duty like leash yeah. nylon with it already in it yeah and to sew it in it just started looking funky right so that's why we thought maybe we do it just with the colors right right okay so bottom line is my last thing though that for everyone who's paracord or metal clip that I would add is that the reason why we like as girls at the moment, our motto was the paracord is because we will offer them in all sizes. So instead of having the one big one inch for every dog, from small to large, we'll have five different sizes and each size a will have a, of the nylon webbing of the actual collar. Okay. So the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the, the smallest one will be like half an inch and then a three quarter inch, probably even smaller than that. Mm -hmm. So all the littles really do have, instead of having this big piece of one inch webbing, plus an e-collar, plus a prong collar, it's a lot on a tiny neck. So we wanted to make it heavy duty, but small. That's where the paracord comes in. We can sew it to any size right, right, without right. it being big. And gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So that's the flexibility with the paracord. Exactly. Gotcha, okay. And I'm sure we could find hardware but it's still way nicer, especially yeah. for smaller dogs. So guys, that's kind of where we're at. Um, as you know, we will work our butts off to yes. make sure that we've got the best possible, just like we do with the leash, the best possible collar. And we'll probably offer some, some different options. The camo from, is so badass. Yeah, the camo, so the camo is badass and everybody wants camo mm -hmm. with paracord. Mm -hmm. Camo and paracord, it's a yeah, nice mix. So, and it looks great on Manny. Manny was rocking it yes. the other day. So, anyways, just hang tough. Um, there will be matching collars to go with your leashes and how exactly they will be put together. The scientists, our mad scientists in the laboratory, are hard at work. Yes, and, Sandra. And, yes, which is Sandra at Wet B2. 
and uh, we're going to make sure that they're the best collars that we can possibly put out. And until they're ready, that's kind of what we got to wait on. So uh, stay tuned and we'll fill you guys in on that. So that's that. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, hang on one second. Thank you very much. Um, final edits for Love Them by Leading Them. Mm -hmm. I'm getting so close. I've got three pages left for the third section. And then I've just got to write the introduction and write the afterword and credits and things like that. And then we have to pick all the ones that we really, 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 really like. Um, and I've got everybody working on a grading system. So, but it's so close. And if all goes right, it's going to be ready for Christmas. So Yay. that's super exciting. And it looks like we're going to finally have the paperback available on Amazon. Yay! So a lot of folks have been asking about that. Being... Trying to get it out internationally, more challenging. Uh, Amazon is definitely putting some, some big roadblocks up about um, being able to make that happen as far as like the, the prices that they would need to charge, not just us, but that they would need to charge to make that viable for them. So we may just have it Amazon US only, we'll see. But stay tuned. So that's good news. We got a new intern who just came in, what, a week ago? Mm -hmm. Last yep. Sunday, so yep. not not quite a week. Yep. So Tanya came in from Georgia. Yes, Georgia. Georgia. Atlanta. Yeah. Can you tell me who sang that? Georgia. Sean. Yeah, that's a bad guess. Um, okay. So Ray Charles. The, what? what um, oh, okay. okay. And um, so we've got Tanya in from uh, Georgia, and so she's learning the ropes and getting into the groove with everything. And then we've got. Ava, who was our last intern, who's also from Poland, so we've got this whole Poland mafia, Polish mafia going on. <laughs> um, they start talking, you know, in a, another language, so you have to watch what's going on. Um, anyway, so Ava, we have coerced into staying for the next year. She really, 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 really wants to learn as much as possible and be able to pivot out of here and build her own business and have all the skills needed to be able to do that. So that is super cool to be able to provide for her. On our side of it, she provides a, a shit ton of organizational, um, she was in the corporate world for years and years and years. She's just got great communication skills. She's got a great attitude and she's just working on her dog skills now. But yeah. meanwhile, she's like, just kind of like rippling out all these other great skills that, that have come from her past life of other work. And so we're thrilled to have her. So Ava lives on property now and she will be here for the next year. And so that's super exciting. And we have a brand new trainer coming in, which will, who will remain nameless. <laughs> um, but she comes in on the 28th, 28th of, September. September. Two weeks away. So, keep your eyes peeled for a new trainer. So, lots going on over here, TGD. No, not... Yes, sorry, two weeks. I was like, wait, what day is it? It's Friday okay. the 13th. So, anyways, so lots going on between the leashes, the collars, the new book, the new intern, the old intern, sorry, Ava, uh, the old intern who's now a permanent intern, and a million other projects that we're working on tackling. Um, so, and we're trying, we're actually working on long lines now yes. for, uh, for folks where they can actually make sure that the long line doesn't slip off. So we're, we're working mm -hmm. on trying to and put that together. And maybe even biothane, because a lot of people have been asking about biothane long lines too. God, especially they're heavy though. Unless they they won't gather them. water like cotton or anything. But. If you take them outside, especially like in a park or something, then mm -hmm. you don't have to wash them if it like goes through like... Yeah, I mean, if you take them like to a park, I mean, I can imagine that. <laughs> so anyways, all right, guys. So let's cut here and then let's jump into the first question. What do you say? Let's do it. Cool. By the way, not to detour our next question. Uh -huh. One thing that we forgot to mention, yes, <clears throat> and I know everybody at home is like up in arms and they're like jumping through windows mm -hmm. and like calling people on the phone. There's no hat. I haven't even thought about it because I see you like like this like now. 
I'm just saying, For there's no hat. Mm -hmm. There's there's hair. And a lot of folks, I think a lot of folks thought there was nothing nothing cooking nothing under there. <laughs> a lot of folks were like, ah, he's probably bald under there. Guess what? Got a little got a little something going on. Now, I won't say that I don't have a receding hairline, but I had that since I was 16, so I'll take it. They called me Ben Franklin when I was young. <laughs> it hurt. But at least he was a smart, funny, witty yes. man with a gigantic forehead. And you still got a lot, like, a lot of hair. I'm hanging in there. And it's so soft. Well, great. And I'm sure everybody is super happy to know that. Let's move on to the first. It looks soft too. I, well, that's that's part of, of what I've worked on. Exactly. So can we uh, can we jump into the first question? Oh my god. First question is how do you grow your hair this fast? Okay, not seriously though. The first question is from Champ Ten Twenty Two on Instagram. Yep. How do I reintroduce my boyfriend to my aggressive pit bull? We were successful at we were successful as my dog started eating trees from his hand a few months ago, but then when my boyfriend got comfortable and stood up to walk around after a few months of getting acquainted with my boyfriend, he bit him. That's when I started the prong collar and the good dog foundation training. I am currently working on his state of mind and want to know when would be a good time to allow him in the same space again. Please advise Sean. Okay, this is a tough one. So I've got a lot of notes for this um, for this episode, um, and partially because my brain is a porous thing that cannot recall anything. The other part is that these are really important questions, and I want to make sure I nail them down as best I can. So, first and foremost, <clears throat> you have to absolutely like this blink does it sometimes all right we, we've got a little bit of a technical thing going on with our light back there i just was like is that just me having like a light flash okay so first and foremost you have to change your relationship like comprehensively people that are trying to get dogs that are possessive or guarding them to like other people simply by means of giving having the other person give them food or interact in a positive way, you're not going to get what you want to get. You're not going to get where you want to go. So without the relationship shift, you're, you're, you're effed to be, to be perfectly frank, mm -hmm. because what's going to happen is your dog's just going to stay in this pattern of like, this is my owner. You stay away, meaning boyfriend. And at some points, maybe I'll tolerate you. Some points, maybe you're okay. Some points, maybe I'll take some food from you. And at some points, when you move a certain way, I'm going to nail you. So when a dog is in a really great space with the owner, and the dog is respectful of the owner, and the dog is respectful of the rules, and the dog is respectful of what happens when they break the rules, they tend not to break the rules very much. And they tend to inhibit even behaviors that they would like to act on and so without your relationship shifting you're toast so i'm glad that you got our prong collar i think she got prong collar foundation video mm -hmm. yeah. um it will give you some very strong foundational tools of how to actually control your dog using good tools um but it will also if you dive really deep into it it will through the PDF, give you a lot of information about relationship dynamics and about what you need to do to change the way your dog sees you, sees your home, and then sees whoever comes into your home. So that's critical. Um, you need to analyze your affection, analyze how much access your dog has to you. So do you just give your dog tons of affection? Is your dog allowed to just come up into your space, jump on your lap, anything like that? Those are all bad messages. Those are all messages that tell your dog everything's up for grabs, including you. And if there's something I don't like, you damn tootin', I'm going after it. Um, so, and, and I'm going to backtrack one because I missed one, which is basically, this is like the, the statement. And it's, it's your house. 
it's your rules, and it's your guests. You have to think like that. You have to stop thinking like, it's my house that I share with my dog mm -hmm. and we're trying to kind of navigate it. Yeah. Bullshit. It's your house. It's your rules and it's your guests. Your dog is your dog. There is a hierarchy. People don't want to acknowledge it. There's a hierarchy. Human here, dog here. Listen to what the fuck I have to say. Don't mess up. Don't bite anybody. Don't misbehave. And we'll have a great time and we'll have a big life. So super critical. So once again, analyze the affection. If you're giving tons of unearned affection, it's number one cause for possessive protective behavior. Access to your personal space. Once again, I'd say the number two cause for possessive protection behavior, uh, protective behavior, things like that. Um, and then like furniture and, and things like that. And can your dog just get on any piece of furniture it wants? Can your dog just jump on the chair or on the couch or, or anywhere and, or on your lap? And do you pet it and reward it and all that stuff? Like you have to think about every single thing that's going on being a message to your dog that is giving your dog either a green light or a red light. All the affection, all the access, all the allowing, all the non-accountability is a green light. All of the opposite is a red light. And that's what will keep your dog in a safer spot. Now, having the tools, prong collar, teaching place, teaching all the stuff that's on that video or in that video, and then holding your dog accountable will absolutely help you. But there is no like secret space where I can tell you, okay, it's time for you to be able to reintroduce your boyfriend. You know when it's time to reintroduce your boyfriend? When you're kicking ass. When your dog believes you. When your dog buys in. When your dog sucks, stops acting like an asshole. When your dog stops taking initiative to go after people. That's when it might be time to actually bring people in and then start having your dog not engage, not take food, not interact, but exist in place, across the room, on a prong and leash. Don't fucking move. That's where you stay. My boyfriend and me, we're over here. You, you're over there. I love you, but there's no confusion. Mm -hmm. Humans here, dogs here. And that would be my best recommendation. And I know it sounds like tough love. I know it sounds like, God, like that's really harsh. But it's the reality. If, if you were my sister, I would be telling you the exact same thing. And I would be like, from a loving place, here's all the stuff you've got to do if, if your true desire is to be able to have your boyfriend over and have him safe. These are the steps that you go through to get there. So I hope that helps. You ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Not really, but I'm going to fake it. Jam in. Fake it till you make it. Um, Me. He got so happy when you said that. What? Fake it till you make it? And he's like, I've faked it all my life. <laughs> I'm really a bad dog. Anyways, go ahead. He's not a bad dog. He is a unicorn dog. <laughs> a unicorn. Don't, don't put that. Luckily, he can't hear because he'd be like, I'm a unicorn dog. <laughs> okay. That means special treats. Anyways, go ahead. Let's number let's jam two. on this. We got a lot of questions to get to. Okay. Number two is yep. also on Instagram from Genevieve11. Mm -hmm. I have a two-year-old male dachshund, mm -hmm. neutered, who I got at eight weeks. Mm -hmm. From the start, he was fearful, hid behind pillows, terrified of outside, people, especially men. He has been to a behavior behaviorist who did not give much practical advice. Mm -hmm. He's on Prozac and Xanax, which have helped a little. He's much better going on walks, walking by men, not freaking out at every noise. What I would most like help with is his extreme reactivity to other dogs. He doesn't lunge or show aggression, just an ear-splitting bark. I have tried bringing high-value treats to distract him. His sister is calm. Typically, he takes cues from her, except this issue. I would love to be able to take him more places, but he's so reactive, and this is seriously the most jarring bark of all time. A cross between a seal and a very large dog. Any suggestions would be appreciated. Love your videos. Thank you. And just to clarify, jarring was jarring. Just in case oh, anybody wasn't sure. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. It, it adds a little international flair to it. 
So, okay. I also, but I also said dark zones, like... I know. It's, it's I was going to give you props, but I didn't want to interrupt. Because, yeah. like, you really, you nailed it. Like, every German would be super proud. <laughs> so, okay. So, you went to a behaviorist. Lots of drugs recommended. I'm not surprised. That's how they roll. Um, so, your dog is probably a little bit more zombified. I'm not going to say your dog is a zombie, but... Your dog is most likely, if he's on two different medications that are that strong, yeah. probably much more low-key just in general. Um, does that mean your dog is better behaved? Does it mean your dog is in better control of itself or making better decisions? No, it just means your dog's heavily medicated. So I'm not down with that. My, my personal philosophy is train the dog sans medication or sans medication, depending on if you're going to really speak it right. Um, and then find out what you get and find out what you can get. Find out what your dog's capable of. I'm super not into medicating dogs prior to training unless the dog is so out of its mind. And there are dogs that are so out of their minds that do better with medication straight out of the gate. But they're a tiny percentage. The other part of this, I'm going to keep this short, is like... <sighs> You're saying that your dog is barking like a seal and some other God knows what, um, super loud and not aggressive towards people, or I can't remember what the other thing was. Fearful of men and in general people. People are men? Yes. In general, just fearful of things. I'm offended by that. Yeah. Anyways, um, men are people. Uh, so... <laughs> So sorry. There's been a lot of like gender <laughs> gender uh, conversations. Um, anyways, rewarding your dog, which is what you're doing, by giving food when your dog, especially if you're doing high value treats or anything like that, or any food at all, when your dog is barking, positive reinforcement works like this. Let me keep it super simple, and I'm not being condescending. For anybody listening, it reinforces whatever behavior that is being given food or be given, being given praise or being given a toy, it increases the behavior. It does not decrease the behavior. Mm -hmm. Even though the concept is we're going to give you food and you're going to like that guy or you're going to like that dog, you're going to like that squirrel, or you're going to feel good about this. Mm -hmm. That's not what happens. What ends up happening is you reinforce it. You make it stronger. You're rewarding it. So let's get off the food, get rid of it, toss it out. If it's good, nibble, it, nibble on it yourself, but do not feed it to your dog. Put your dog on some good tools, put your dog at least on a prong collar, and correct your effing dog for acting like a jackass around other dogs. Like that barking, do you think your dog cannot do it? Absolutely. freaking lutely is your dog not doing it because there's no real consequence except that maybe I get fed some extra delightful stuff? Exactly. That's exactly what's going on. So let's get off the food. Let's get on to some kind of consequence that's actually valuable that would cause your dog to actually make better choices in the future. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay. You make me want to laugh, <laughs> and then I can't enjoy it because I'm trying so hard to just like not. I'm sorry. I'm a, ter I'm a terrible person, but it's because I'm not a human. Anything. <laughs> You're the opposite of that. <laughs> okay. And I mean mean. I don't mean opposite okay. of men. <laughs> okay. Let's rock. Okay. Question number three is also on Instagram from High Fives for Canines. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sean. Looking forward to this new video. Me My too. <laughs> My question pertains to business. Is it pertains? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now yeah. I'm yeah. slightly You can call it plantains too, but that would be something to eat. My question pertains to business. As a business owner, dog trainer, you know success of the dog is highly related to the determination of work put in by our clientele. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice on the best ways to screen or attract better, more dedicated clients? Great I question. Do. And I've been posting about this for the last two and a half weeks on Instagram stories talking specifically about this, which is creating a brand, creating content, using transparency, using all of these different mechanisms to leverage, <clears throat> to 
to leverage the ability to engage with potential clients in a fashion where they have the ability to assess who you are and find out if you're a good fit. So let me see if I can, if I can dissect this a little bit. Okay, so transparency is everything. As far as what I teach, what I believe, what I teach at T3, what we teach at T3, um, how I run my own business, it's all transparency. Transparency of tools, transparency of prices, transparency of programs, um, transparency of no guarantees, I'm running out of fingers, um, transparency of who we are. So all of those things, I think if I'm not mistaken, you're, you're asking about, <clears throat> you're asking about pre-screening and, and, and getting, uh, or having the best chance of getting the best clients to come in. If you think about it that way, the more you put out information wise about who you are, you're creating a pre-screening slash filtering process or system. People are going to go, well, that's too much, or oh, I'm not down with those tools, or I don't really like their attitude, or you know, whatever it might be. Or they go, man, I've done food training, and like that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who does e-collar training, and wow, their work looks great. The results look great. I really like their attitude. Super nice. I love that they put their prices right up there. I don't have to get on the phone and do some kind of salesy bullshit with them. Mm -hmm. I can just have a nice interaction and, and, and then sign up straight through their contact form without actually having to do any kind of sales or anything like that. So there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And old school is going to always push you in the other direction. Old school sales, marketing, dog training BS is always going to move you in the other direction or, or push you in the other direction, which is don't tell them anything. Don't tell them your prices. Don't tell them your tools. Don't tell them how you work. Don't give them any secrets. Get them on the phone and sell them, right? Get them on the phone and do the dance. Prong callers just mimic a mother's dog bite or, you know, da 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 da. The pricing programs that we have, you know, well, we can definitely, you know, move them around and, and, and make sure that that suits you and things like that. Like, they're going to recommend that you, <sighs> that instead of being transparent, you're going to make the big move of trying to get somebody on the phone so you can then try and sell them so you can then manipulate them so you can then maneuver them into a space now i don't know about you but i know about me and i can't stand that mm -hmm. the moment that i feel that someone is trying to sell to me the moment i feel someone is trying here's a good example if i go to your website say i'm looking for a dog trainer i go to your website and i'm i see your programs but there's no prices you're toast. You're already off my list. You might be the best one there, but I'm going to look at it. I'm going to be like, why is there no pricing? Well, I know why there's no pricing. There's no pricing because you want to get me on the phone so you can then sell me on your programs because you don't trust that I will make decisions based on everything else that I see that you've provided um, and then sign up with your program. So it involves a bit of dog going crazy. Uh, invol it, involves, it involves work. It involves risk. It involves shifting away from traditional methodologies as far as sales and with a real goal, and here's the big one, a real goal towards people selling themselves. People who sell themselves are in a completely different state psychologically than people that have been sold to. So I'd really love for you to think about that. Like, how do you feel about sales? How do you feel about when you know somebody is putting it on with you and, and you're going to buy a car or whatever and they're giving the song and dance and they're, you can feel it like they're trying to be clever and they're trying to be crafty and like not make it over, not make it obvious, but yet they're trying to move you in this direction. It doesn't feel good. I don't want it. What I want is I want to be in my jammies at three in the morning. I want to go to your website. I want to see all of your stuff. I want to see who you are, I want to see your results, I want to see your prices, I want to see your tools, I want to see your programs, and then I want to say, I like that. Click, let me sign up, and let me go from there. Now, what ends up happening is you have to be willing, and this is the risk part, you have to be willing to let go of 
and here's where everybody struggles. You have to be willing to let go of the people that don't fit into all of those other, like all those other compartments, all those other places where they're like, well, financially, maybe if I got on the phone, I could turn them, or maybe if I got them on the phone, they'd be okay about a prong collar or an e-collar, or maybe if I got them on the phone, like, no, let them go. Use it as a filter. You want a screening process? You want a filter? Use it. It's much better to have two, three, four, five phone calls or emails a week that are highly qualified because they've already done the work and know exactly who you are than have 25 that are like, yeah, can you tell me what you do and who you are and what does it cost and, and can I do one session, you know, and I'm not down for those prong collar things. So like, let's not even get into that. Yeah. So hopefully this makes sense. It's a really simple concept. Transparency, honesty, put it all out there, share with everybody, and trust that it will work as a filtering system for you to bring in your best clients. It's not guaranteed, there's no promises, you will still get some people that will sneak through and you'll go like, ooh, how did that happen? It's gonna happen to anybody, mm -hmm. but for the most part, we do, we do no private, you know, we don't do any uh, free consultations. We don't go to anybody's house and try and sell ourselves. We don't have any demo dogs. We don't like, that's our demo dog. We don't have anything like that. So we just put out our information. People go to our website. They fill out our contact form. Then Liz emails them back and says, when's a good time for you for a phone call? They get on the phone and she doesn't try and sell them on any programs. She just says, what kind of situation are you looking at? And then what's the best program for you and your dog? And then what's the quickest, what's the earliest date we can get you in? And that's it. So hope that makes sense. It, it, it's Instagram, it's all small case. I don't know how to function in all small case world. I hear you. Okay. Okay, so this Lay is- Lay down me, Tuts. Question, what, what number is it? Um, it's question number five. Okay, nice. Question number five is mm -hmm. from, I guess <laughs> it's Leah Sky C. I hope that's right. And the question is, any tips for international traveling, especially for long trips across oceans? There are so many horrible and tragic traveling stories that anything to ease the trip and perhaps any carriers or companies with a good, good reputation would be great. How to prepare dogs traveling in crates that need to transfer flights? Okay, so because we've got 10 questions we're trying to answer, we're gonna really try and move quick through this. So you flew your dogs over from New Zealand, mm -hmm. which is what, a 24 hour flight, something like that? Mm, they had one, one and a half hour flight to get to Auckland, which mm -hmm. is like the biggest place to like yeah, have yeah, biggest yeah. flights. Um, and then one 18 hour flight. Okay, so give people the scoop on okay. how that worked and how you picked the airline and so okay. on and so forth. So my recommendation would be, first of all, to find someone who provides a service to help you out and assist you with everything. So you can do it on your own, you can buy the flight tickets, get all the paperwork together, and it will turn out cheaper, but it's not always the best way. So the reason why I think it's not the best way is because having someone who tells you exactly what kind of vaccinations to have, what kind of documents to get from your vet, how long, for example, mine had could only be 30 days before the flight mm. was. That's and right. yes, exactly. So I I didn't know that. So if I would have gotten them two months before they you flew out, they wouldn't have trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they tell you all those things and details and send you reminders of like, hey, today is when you can start doing this process and this process and send us those documents. We have them on file. We sent them to all the companies, to the boarding facility. So they took care of the boarding too when they had the the one flight and the connecting flight, they stayed, stayed um, overnight at a boarding facility. So first thing I would recommend is find a good company. So the way I went about it is I literally just went on Google, found most of the ones on the first page and sent them all a message and then went by how did they approach the situation? Were they friendly? Did they get back to me soon? What were the reviews like and just went from there. Um, so then when I chose the company and got in touch with them and chose which one I wanted to do, um, they 
helped me through the whole process. It was super easy, super simple. Um, it was much easier for me. It depends where you're flying from. I assume you're flying them from here in the States to some other country. Um, flying them from New Zealand, both of the dogs was really easy because there's no rabies. They only got like kennel cough vaccine, like things. They mm -hmm. had like no vaccinations, yeah. but like ever because there's like no things really. Yeah. And they didn't have any flea prevention or anything like that because there were no fleas or ticks. So I assume there will be many more vaccinations that you will have to have here than I had to. And also decline, depends where you're flying in. If you're flying in New Zealand, into New Zealand or Australia, it will be much harder because they don't have rabies. So they are very careful about what kind of dogs they let in. Um, so I would look into that, which again, the travel company is going to help you out with. And luckily nowadays, um, the time that they spend on when a dog flies in in quarantine, it's almost nothing. I think it's like 10 days if you fly them from South Africa. Mm -hmm. So they're not like they used to be like six months or right, something right, ridiculous right. like that. Right. So that's really cool. Um, as far as crates, I had one big, like extra, extra large um, big pla remember the big plastic mm -hmm. crate mm -hmm. so I had that already so I used it the other one was a wooden crate provided by them so most traveling companies already provide a wooden crate for you to fit your dog and they're really nice and long and they're really large so I would make sure that your dog is used to a crate and any crate will be fine and I actually would recommend not medicating the dog if they do offer it um, I have found that it's so stressful as it is to like go through the process and the best thing to do is just have your dog used to sleeping sleeping in the crate maybe the crate moving around a little bit will be good because they put them on little carriers and roll them around mm -hmm. another cool thing that they did is um, they showed me the boarding facility that they stayed in um, they were completely separate. They had their own little room with their own private yard, which was really neat. And most of them do that. They also send you a video and photo traveling company that is how to set up water in the crate as they travel to where it doesn't spill over and people don't have to open up your crate and lose your dog because it has to be zip tied. So they can give them water from the outside without having to manipulate the crate at all. So your dog stays safe at all times and that's basically it yeah great that's awesome that's super helpful stuff so hopefully that's super helpful um, I was just gonna add for domestic stuff and I know this isn't a domestic question but a lot of folks fly domestic with their dogs so number one thing try and grab a direct flight so that precludes you from having to deal with your dog possibly sitting on the tarmac or possibly being transferred, possibly being lost. Who, <clears throat> excuse me, who knows what could happen. So for me, um, when I've, I've only done it a bit in the past, when I have done it, direct flights. So go with direct flights. Um, also be super, super aware of what the weather conditions are. So if you're flying into Texas in the middle, in the middle of the summer, and your dog is, is, has a light, or you're flying out of Texas in the middle of the summer during the middle of the day, be super conscious, or any place where it's gonna be exceptionally hot, be super conscious of your dog sitting on the tarmac for an extended period of time. So for me, that would con concern me tremendously. Same thing would go if um, I'm sending my dog to an incredibly cold climate. Um, I would wanna be aware of what I'm sending my dog to and whether my dog has a fighting shot like Manny wouldn't do so well if he ended up at the Arctic, you know, so unless he was bundled and, and you know, all of that. It's so, so, tricky. so think about, think about direct flights and think about temperatures. Um, those are a couple of really good, easy things, uh, or, or a couple of very easy things to try and, um, avoid disasters with. And then as Marta said, um, both for international but for domestic, do your research and find out who's the best carrier mm -hmm. for that because there are differences in carriers. And like forums, Facebook groups yeah. for traveling with pets. There's so many and so many people have so many valuable tips that I wouldn't have thought of yeah. myself either. So, so. jump in and, and check them out.
Cool. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Woo. Are you ready for question number six? Either that or I'm ready for nappy time. Okay. Let's so let, see, let's, let's, see, let's, let's see the question. Let's see how we do. Okay. Question number six is also from Instagram mm -hmm. from Bohemian Soul 26. Bohemian. Bohemian Soul. My dog heals very well on her prong collar, but on her flat collar, she doesn't follow cues as well. How do I help her correct this? So I'm scratching my ear to give myself a little bit of time to decompress. Okay. Um, my, I was wondering what's happening. My inner Jeff Gelman is like Ooh. ready to come blazing out. Guys, and especially you, <laughs> who's not a guy, I don't think, um, but you could be, bohemian soul, I guess you could, that, that could be either way. Um, if your dog heals well on a prong collar, for fuck's sake, walk him on a prong collar. There's no reason to get off of the tools that work. The goal, as I've stated in other posts, and I'm not yelling at you, even though I am a little bit, the, the goal is not to get your dog off the tools. Your goal is to get your dog out of the problem situations. So if it, if it takes wearing a prong collar to have your dog walk nice, have your dog not reactive, have your dog be fun to be around, have, a, have your dog be a dog that you can take anywhere you want, then fuck anything else. Forget all the rest of the tools. Use the prong collar. There's no demerits. There's no dog training gods that are looking, well, there might be, dog training gods looking down upon you. Screw them. And anybody else who's got an issue or an opinion about, well, your dog's not really trained if it's using a prong collar. It's such bullshit. If your dog works well on a prong collar, walk your dog on the fucking prong collar and enjoy the shit out of it. My guys, even as they got older, Manny, Belle, Junior, all of them, they walk like dreams. They all were on prong collars. I never wanted to have to wrestle with them. I never wanted to have to like battle if like, Belle's like, well, but there's a squirrel or Manny's like, there's a shade tree. And I'm on the way out, like whatever it is, it's like, no, I want to be able to just very gently, easily communicate with my dogs and say, no, this is how we're walking. Like, I'm not going to put them on flat buckle collars. I'm not going to put them on martingales. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put them on something else that works less good. Why the hell would I? It makes my life harder. It makes their life harder. Don't make your life harder. Enjoy yourself. You've already found your answer. That's the great part. Enjoy it. Rock it. Knock, knock it out of the park and tell anybody who's got a problem with it to kiss your behind. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Yeah. Let's rock. Get off of TikTok and let's rock. <laughs> okay. Question number <laughs> seven. Why am I struggling? See, usually I have my printed out version. I know. It's so much easier for me. Right? Yeah. But it's okay. Life's throwing you it's some okay. curveballs. okay. You're helping me out. Teamwork. Question number... Teamwork. Teamwork. teamwork uh, question number nine. I'm waiting for my teamwork. Yeah. Number seven. Sean! What? I'm waiting for your fist bump. I've uh, been like, oh, oh, teamwork. Well, well, and I, you just like, show me your time. I was like tongue? teamwork, and you went. <laughs> Guys, I'm a, slow, I'm a slow learner. I, I, I mean, she went like this. Like yeah, that. because it was supposed to go like this. Look, do the thing. I don't know if you're shifting gears. No, or go on, off go on. Ring or what you're look, doing. no, go like, and then look at the camera, and then we would have done this boom without like even looking at each other. Okay. That was the goal, but never mind. It's so relationship right. dynamics, we're still working on them. We're, we're still, working on the fist bumps. We're still working on it. Okay, okay. so anyway. question number nine. Did you hear that? I did, go ahead. Question number seven from Tyrese. Tyrese is saying- What up Tyrese? He's saying, how can you get board and trains from out of state to reach a No, lab? that's question number one. It says two. Go to question number one. 
and B set up to fail. That's all I have to say. I'm kidding. Question number ten. Question number one is also still from Tyrese. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what up, Tyrese? <laughs> okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Mm. Okay. What should a solid training plan have for board and trained dogs? How do you structure yours? Tyrese, these are deep, deep secrets. Um, cannot that share. cannot be revealed to any other dog trainers. Mm -mm. Um, we could reveal them, but of course, as you know, we would have to then kill you. Okay, question so, number eight. Um, no, to give you a quick little rundown, I know what you, you already know what you're doing, but it's kind of a cool thing to compare notes with, with other dog trainers and see what they're, what they're going after. First thing I'd say is really make a determination about your demo, your demographic, your environment. Um, what are people looking for in your actual environment? Because I have dog trainer friends that live like out in the middle of nowhere, like, and, and I mean like in the tundra. And those clients are looking for very different things than say our clients here in LA or in New Orleans who are in tight confines of the city that are looking like, I gotta be able to get my crazy dog to walk down the sidewalk without like lunging at cats, dogs, people, so on and so forth. Then you'll have people that live, like I said, out in the tundra or some variation of that. And that's not even a consideration for them. They just want their dog to be able to recall back to them, um, hold a down stay, maybe place for inside the house. So anyways, I, and, and I know that if I'm not mistaken, you're a city dweller, so you are probably more in alignment with what, uh, with what I'm sharing, but it's still a really good thing to think about. Like, I, I hate using the term because it sounds like so like not dog centric, but what product, what product do you want to deliver? What product do you want to give to the marketplace? And for me, the product that I want to deliver are dogs that live very, very, very similarly to my dogs. I don't ask a ton from them. I ask them to walk nicely, to come when I call them, to stay on place, to not jump on people, to not be jackasses. Um, it's, it's, it's not this like high, high level of obedience, but, and, and, and I want them to be able to be calm and I don't want them in an, in, in an anticipatory mode as far as like food and rewards constantly. I can't stand that. So I don't want my dog, like if you could see Manny right now, he's just laying here snoozing. I don't want him laying here like this. Are you gonna feed me? Are you gonna give me a command? Is it time? Right? And, and I'm exaggerating being dramatic, but it's something that as far as what I wanna deliver to the marketplace is in alignment with how I want to live with dogs. So that's my first choice. And that dictates everything I do, which means simplicity. I, I, I remove everything that doesn't need to be in our program um, because owners don't need unnecessary information. It's already challenging for them. It's already difficult for them. They already struggle. So anything you can strip away to make their life easier, makes you a hero. So that all said, I'll jump into just uh, the basics of what we do. Um, we offer e-collar heel. Every dog that comes through our program is on a prong and an e-collar, and I think you know that. Um, and we do e-collar heel with the prong as a backup. Um, every dog learns sit. First they learn it um, if they're puppies, they learn it with food luring, and then on to prong collar, and then on to e-collar, overlaying it. <clears throat> same thing goes for down, same thing goes for place, same thing goes for recall, same thing goes for crate, waiting for food, thresholds, out. Um, so we, we work every dog, like we always say, every dog is going to go through this basic blueprint. Every dog's gonna learn sit, down, place, recall, heel, um, out, waiting for food, crate. Every dog's gonna learn it. How they're going to learn it is going to vary tremendously. It's going to depend completely on that dog, what, what their 
focus ability is, what their motivation ability is, what their cognitive ability is, all of that stuff is going to determine um, how they get there and how far they get there because there's a real reality as far as like not every dog is designed to be doing highfalutin obedience. It's just the, the, it's just the truth. There are cognitively challenged dogs and not acknowledging that is doing owners and dogs a disservice. So that's one thing. Um, and then of course, we address any specific issues. So if we've got intense reactivity, we go after that. If we've got intense resource guarding, we go after that. If we've got intense dog aggression, we go after that. If we've got intense human aggression, we go after that. If we've got intense separation anxiety, we go after that. So we've got this kind of like, whole basic program of all these commands they're going to learn. Then we've got all of the behavior mod stuff they're going to learn. But within all of that, and here's kind of the magic, is that we've found a way to use all of the different interactions, all of the different moments, all of the different things we're teaching to help leverage better attitude, better state of mind, better behavior, not just learning a behavior, but better behavior, better demeanor. And if you teach a dog to sit, down, place, knock it off, sit, down, place, recall, all, whatever, the, whatever your basic commands are, and you fairly teach it, but then you hold the dog highly accountable. And if you've got a bratty dog, you push them a little bit and you demand more from them. And if you've got a soft dog, you take it a little bit easier on them, but you still hold them accountable, but you find a way for them to succeed. And you end up using the commands as a methodology or a program to be able to elicit responses from dogs that are problematic, that need to be addressed. Hopefully this makes sense then you can actually use, to be, use obedience as something far more profound than just training obedience commands. Like if you watched us in here training a dog that's dangerous or has serious issues going on, you would see like, how are you using place or sit or down or recall or heal to be able to address this stuff? And I'm telling you, we do. There's ways to do this that are very effective for dogs. And so I'll plant that seed and let you run with it. But that's basically how we build our program. And you can borrow from that. Uh, but mostly what I would suggest is that you tailor your program, keep it as simple as possible, and tailor your program to exactly what your client's needs are. Get rid of any dog trainer ego. Get rid of any of the dog training gods looking down and judging your work or any of that bullshit and just do what's best for your clients. And can't lose. Okay. You ready to rock? Number eight. I removed myself. Okay, number nine. Here we go. It's number eight yep. on the Good Dog page from Jennifer Lee. Yes, that's Facebook. Yes. Just in case people... Sorry, are... sorry, yeah. Facebook, the Good yeah. Dog. Yeah. Hi, I adopted a rescue dog three weeks ago, a two-year, two year, eight months German Shepherd. He's fine with people. A uh, problem whenever he sees other dogs far away on the street. He pulls, whines, lunges, and sometimes barks. Is he excited, reactive, or dog aggressive? He would never ask. What can I do to train him to cope with this issue? Appreciate your advice. That's the question. Can you read that one one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. Hi, I adopted a rescue dog three weeks ago. A mm -hmm. two years and eight months old German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. He's fine with people. The problem is whenever he sees other dogs far away on the street, he pulls, whines, lunges, and sometimes barks. Is he excited, reactive, or dog aggressive? What can I do to train him to cope with this issue? Appreciate your advice. Okay. Jennifer Lai, Jennifer Lee. I'm not sure which way to pronounce your name, but um, forgive me. Okay, so you've got a newly adopted GSD. Congratulations. They can be fantastic dogs. They can also be noisy pains in the asses. So prepare yourself. Um, first thing, you had a couple questions where you're like, 
Is he excited? Is he reactive? I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, is he aggressive? Um, none of those matter. So let's, let's remove the questions that get in the way of finding the answers. Because a lot of people, if you go to a dog behaviorist or you go to some fancy pants um, dog trainer who wants to elevate their ego rather than tell you the truth, will dive into this and be like, wow, let's, let's figure out because it's really a different thing. I mean, if, if, if he's dog aggressive, then we've got a very different situation on our hands. And, and if he's just dog reactive, it's, this, it's, it's all a bunch of bullshit. Stop thinking about that, stop processing, stop focusing, stop working on that. It's so simple. Here's what you got. You've got a German Shepherd who's misbehaving. Nobody knows why, unless you are able to call up like Elon Musk and see if he's got some kind of like little like brain, like little thing that he can snap onto a dog's head and get the information and retrieve it from him. And the dog's like, I'm dog aggressive. And unless you can get that, we just don't know. That's a really bad joke. But the fact of the matter is you just have to move ahead. So when we get dogs in, we don't think about like, oh wow, is he reactive? Is he dog aggressive? Like, yes, we will check the dogs around certain things because that's what owners are looking for. They're looking for deeper information on that stuff. But the fact of the matter is how we're going to work them through the program is really, it's no different. A dog that's misbehaving on a walk, which is your primary concern, it doesn't matter if he's excited, if he's reactive, or if he's aggressive. What matters is that you know how to control him, that you know how to train him, that you know how to manage him, that you know how to get his best. That's it. Keep it super, super simple, super clear. Don't let any of this other monkey business you know, waylay you or mislead you or drive you nuts. Just keep it simple. So if you want help with it, and you can go to my page, www.thegooddog.net, and you can look up um, our do-it-yourself uh, videos, which show you how to do prong collar training as well as e-collar training. But you could start with just prong collar training, fit the prong collar right to your shepherd, and learn how to actually get your shepherd to walk in a nice heel first, not around distractions, not around dogs, not around anything that might provoke him. Get that rock solid. And then slowly start to move out into situations that are more challenging. And what you do is, once you've got this heel and your dog knows how to calmly walk by your side, and then you see a trigger and your dog looks at it and starts to load, you say no and you give your dog a nice firm pop on the leash, letting your dog know that choice is unwanted simple. Now, it doesn't matter if that choice is, I'm excited. It doesn't matter if that choice is, I'm reactive. I don't know what to do. It doesn't matter if it's, I want to go get that dog. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you employ the tools and techniques to be able to get this dog from a space of being out of control and problematic to one that's in control and not problematic. And I can speak to this because I've been there. I've had that dog way, way, way back in the day and I had no idea what was the origin or the issue or what the main problem was. All I knew was like, he's misbehaving, I've got to address it, and that's all I did. And what ended up happening, he ended up going from like being in, and he was like, pretty nasty with other, do other dogs, he went to us, he moved into a space where he could be around any dog on a pack walk, in a training session, just about any, any possible situation and be rock solid. I didn't find out what his actual problem was. All I did was say, here are the rules, here's what's allowed, here's what's not allowed. And I used the right tools to allow me to communicate that to him and we walked off into the sunset being able to walk everywhere. We walked hours and hours and hours and like chihuahuas would like, you know, come running out of their houses to come after us and it was like, no big deal. All because I had control of my dog. So 
just to finish it up, do not focus on what the issue is. Instead, focus on getting control of your dog, managing your dog, leveraging the right tools, and getting your dog into the best possible space possible. And so that's not to oversimplify or dumb down. It's just to remove extraneous things that are going to confuse you, worry you, concern you, and not help you achieve your goals. So I hope that helps. Bless you. Me. Me sneeze. When you can sneeze, I'll command. Okay. Okay. Question number nine is from Vi Nick. Or V Nick? I'm not sure, to be perfectly okay. frank. But it's, it's a cool name for Facebook. Yeah. And um, a big fan, always on our page. So thanks for all the input. Appreciate it. And the question is on the Good Dog Training page on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the question is, we usually see you and your staff training dogs, rehabilitating them. But what does a typical day look like for your dogs? What would you regard as the ideal daily routine for a dog from waking to bedtime? Either with the owner at home all day long or away at work? This is something that I've never seen any trainers talk about specifically or maybe I haven't been paying close attention. I have a great training schedule which I found online that's awesome for helping people understand what, ex what exactly crate training, crate training can mean. But what about adult dogs? Thank you. Well, so we've got Manny and his day basically looks like sleeping. Sometimes he goes in the crate, sometimes he gets fed, and then sometimes he pees. And that's about his day. So he sleeps a lot. He sleeps a lot. He's getting old. And he gets cuddled a lot. Yeah. He, but he's getting old. He's probably like 12, something like that. So anyways, Maybe. what we're going to do is I'm going to have Marta share what life looks like in New Orleans with our three dogs there, which entails her going to school, her dealing with our dogs, her having a life, and also training other dogs and doing sessions, and working with clients and homework and everything else. So I think you're a good candidate to try and explain this stuff. So pressure okay. is on. Okay. Stop it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so basically, um, it's a it's not not the easiest question because there's so much stuff going start, on. Start start with the beginning of the morning. What's it, what's it yes? Look like? I'm just trying to think. Do I start with when I go to school or when I don't go to school? As soon as you wake up. Yes, but I don't go to school every day. So when I wake up on a school day, okay, which is was five five days a week. Now it's two times a week. So when I wake up on a typical school day, I aim to leave my house our house at seven twenty more or less. So. The first thing where I do that, the first thing I do when I wake up is all the dogs go straight away in the backyard for party times and they sniff around, party, do their thing, and in the meantime I can get ready, do my stuff, and can they I usually clarify when you say all the dogs, you mean our dogs? Our dogs. So no client dogs. The two border collies and Billy Brown. Border collies and B uh, B B Billy Brown. BCs and BB. Anyway. Just to make sure everybody knows that we don't have them in. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as I wake up, our dogs, the Border Collies and Billy Brown, go in the backyard. The client dogs wait until a little bit later. So I will do my thing and then once I'm done, I'll bring them inside. So that's like 20 minutes maybe that they spend partying, just having a bit of a romp around and stretch their legs early in the morning. Once I'm done with all the stuff that I need to do uh, to get ready for school, then I make sure I have enough time always scheduled for the training dogs. I'll take each of them for party separately, feed them, make sure they're okay, everyone is safe, tuck in their crates, and that's for the training dogs. Then before I leave, I'll make sure that Billy Brown, because she's the youngest one, and she still sometimes struggles with like stuff like potty training. She's a very happy, a very excited and energetic dog. So she stays in the crate while I'm gone and the two border collies are out in the house doing their thing, mostly sleeping in bed. Um, and the dogs that we have for training are always separate from our dogs. So even though the border collies have the roam of the house, they never have access to where any of the training dogs are while I'm gone. 
So I know that even though I'm gone, nothing bad can happen. Right. Then when I come back, the Border Collies and Billy Brown go outside for parties. And then once they're back inside, Billy Brown goes in the crate and then the training dogs come out. And then typically I would, it's not always at the same time, it's always very flexible, but I will make sure either I take our dogs swimming for a walk around town or somewhere off leash running around depending on the weather. Is it raining? Is it too hot? Um, do I want to swim them or do I feel like walking? So all of that is flexible and I try to mix it up for everyone, for myself, for client dogs and for Billy Brown and the Border Collies. And then I would like make sure however it aligns in between sessions, I would train or have a client session. And whenever there is there are clients at the house or I am training, even though the Border Collies have the realm of the house, they are then tucked away in the bedroom and they can, they're not in crates, but they're separate. So I don't have to worry about them walking in. If I'm having a dog out that is new, is dog reactive or dog aggressive, um, they would be able to maybe come out if I know that the dog is ready to. And I would only do that if Shelby is there too, in case I need the help. I wouldn't do that on my own because there's always risk and it's always good to have another person there. So it always depends on the dog that is out, if I would have the other dogs be able to come into the training room or not. If I'm at home the whole day, it still goes kind of the same thing. I get up in the morning, same routine, and then I would just train earlier, but same routine. Billy Brown stays in the crate for long periods of time, otherwise she's on place, and she has a lot of structure right now, uh, because we want to make sure that as she grows up, um, that's just going to be her habit and her default that she just does. Just like many humans. And she also the gets lots of playtime with, with the BCs. Outside in the yard as well as the, the walks and the swimming and all the other stuff that she yeah, gets as get well as training. A lot of A lot. Yeah. And they enjoy it a lot too. And they can. They all get along very great. But basically, basically um, all our dogs have Training times too, just like Billy Brown is learning ins and outs of everything, or like I'm doing frisbee training with her right now, so I will do that. Um, Billy Brown goes in the crate. So as far as like the the crate training schedule that you that you posted and asked about, it, it also depends on the age of the dog. So when Billy was younger, I would make sure she gets out every two hours, then every three hours, then every four hours to slowly expand the time she can stay longer but right now I am at the point at the point where she can stay pretty like a good amount of time in there so I can adjust my day as I need to without having to worry about her in the crate so I'm not super consistent about every day at one or every day at three she comes out and does that it's just they have play time in the yard and parties they get outside time, if that's walking or swimming, they get training time, place time, and other fun activities time, but the actual like schedule of the day changes. But they do spend a good amount of time alone at home if I'm not there, or I'm doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of, Does yeah, it yeah. Good, give yeah, people a good... Yeah. No, I think it does. Okay. Yeah, and, and just, I, I think it's always an important thing to, to remind people, I've written about this a lot, but to remind people, a lot of folks get caught up in feeling like they have to be interacting with their dog at all times. I was going to say that they, too. They've yeah. got to have the dogs out. They've got to be training. They've got to yeah. be playing. They've got to be walking. They've got to be driving them around. They've got to be connected and doing something all the time. And the fact of the matter is that it's great for both you and your dog or dogs to have separate time, to have downtime. It's really good for you to have time away from your dogs so you can just decompress, relax, not be on, on that, like, I don't want to say stress level, but it is a stress level. You know, having your dogs out has a certain amount of, I have to be aware, I have to be conscious, I have to be cognizant of what's going on, and that keeps you on a little bit of like an edge. Um, and the same thing goes for your dogs. If your dogs are out, 
They're rambunctious, playing around, doing all sorts of stuff. They're not being conditioned to slow down, calm down, relax, and learn how to just be chill when you need them to be. So I'd love to encourage, on top of what everybody, uh, uh, on top of what Marta just said, I'd love to encourage everybody to give themselves permission to put their dogs away, let their dogs have quiet downtime, which is incredibly healthy for them, mentally and physically, and also the same for you. So you guys, so everybody benefits. Get out of the guilt mode, get out of the guilt trip, get out of the place where you've gotta be consciously interacting with your dogs and get into a space where it's balanced and healthy and then you guys can actually really enjoy each other because it's like, cool, I just did a bunch of stuff I needed to do. Now I can take you out and we can go for a run at the park. Awesome. And it's like our time together. And, and I just think people get lost with that and, and get, I was, just get locked into it. I was going to mention that too um, when you said that because at some point I was so obsessed with taking them out yeah. that I would get major anxiety coming mm. home from school mm. because I have to get them out and I have to do those things. And the anxiety would come from because I didn't feel like it. Because I wanted to, like, after having to spend the whole day, you know, processing, making sure that I like, got all the information and learning, I want to come school, home. Yes, yeah, yeah. I want to come home and maybe sit down for half an hour. But then I would feel the pressure of like they need a bike ride. Then I'm gonna take them swimming, and then when it's cool enough, I'm gonna take them to a park. And then I was so just like, no. And they yeah. didn't go out for a solid month, probably longer. At least all of July, I haven't taken them anywhere. It was yard time, maybe three, four times a day, just like out on your own and that's it because it was too much. And now I actually enjoy taking them out because when I do it when I want to and if right. I feel like it. So now you're in balance. Yes. And, and yeah. that's really what, what I'm, I'm, I'm happy you shared that yeah. because I, I think a lot of people get caught up in that. And so guys... It doesn't make you enjoy your dogs no, anymore. I, I've done the same thing, but way back in the day. And uh, it doesn't make you enjoy your dogs more. It makes you resent your dogs often, and it makes you annoyed with yourself and what you're not accomplishing. So do yourselves, do both of yourselves a favor. Put your dogs away, let them have downtime, and let yourself have downtime. Human time, it's okay, it's healthy, it's good for you. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Are you ready to rock and roll? You, you do realize this is question number 10. We typically do five. So this means we have like, we have not only kicked ass, mm -hmm. and actually I think it's been a pretty good show, but we have made up for a lot of shows that we haven't been able to. We have, yes. You know, we, we promised we were going to do it once a week, and then we're like, this is never going to work. So we're, we're, just so everybody knows, we're down to once a month. Yes. And I think that's good. We're going to give you everything we got once a month. Mm -hmm. And, um, that and will, more questions. Yeah, more questions, but it, it'll keep us sane. Mm -hmm. It's just like putting your dogs away. We're going to put you guys away. Yes. Every once in a while, we're going to put you guys away. For bring, everyone's benefit. We'll bring you back out when it's time, when it's healthy. Yes. Let's do question number 11. I, you keep doing that on purpose, aren't you? Yes. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Okay. Question number 10 is from Jamie Burns, and the question is, my pup growls, just a small growl and no escalation if I touch her head while she's eating. I found this out, I found this out when I was wiping her face one time. My question is, is this fine and is this fine or should I mostly leave her alone when she eats? She does the out command well, it's just if I touch her face. Thanks so much for all you do. Jamie, 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 awesome question. Thank you for asking it. So um, what I like is that you found out by not being a nagging, annoying, let me try and put my hand in my dog's food, let me pet my dog, let me touch my dog, let me hug my dog while it's eating to see if it's safe and if it enjoys having my company this, in this intimate fashion while I'm eating. I love that you were actually probably doing something productive, which sounds like you were cleaning your dog's face, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
points for you. Um, to answer your question, the fact that your dog, she said her dog growls when, when she does that, right? Yes. Yeah, right. So the fact that your dog growls when you're touching its face when it's eating is very normal. And are there dogs that wouldn't do it? Yes. Are there a lot of dogs that would do it? Yes. The whole thing is touching, petting, crowding, putting your hand in the bowl, anything that you're doing that you're like mussing, messing, harassing your dog while, while it's eating. And I know that's not your intention, but I'm just, I'm, this is for you and for everybody else. That's harassing your dog while they're eating has a high likelihood of creating resentment, tension, friction, and even resource guarding. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Like you go from a dog who doesn't have resource guarding issues and then you keep like, well, they should be okay with this and they should be okay with this. Once again, not you, but just in general. They should be okay with this, they should be okay with this, they should be okay with this. And what ends up happening is the dog's like, man, can't you just fucking leave me alone? I'm trying to eat. Why do you have to touch me? Why do you have to pet me? Why do you have to like, and every dog has a different level of sensitivity with that. Like I could pet Manny while he eats and like he probably doesn't know I'm there. So, um, but there's a lot of dogs that I would never, ever, ever do it with because not only do they know you're there, but they're like, get the fuck away from me. I'm trying to eat now. When you have a dog that's starting to be proactively protective and possessive about things, you already said your dog's great without command, so that's awesome. But when you have a dog that's like being proactively possessive and protective about things, then you have to start going after that. If you're not doing anything wrong, if you're not pressuring the dog and you're not being silly about it, but your dog is starting to like own the couch, own certain parts of the carpet, own certain parts of the kitchen, if you walk by them while they're eating and they growl, things like that, those things all need to be addressed. That's all super, um, let me find the right word. That is all super unacceptable. That is all terrible behavior. Um, that said, when we're being, excuse me, when we're being incredibly invasive about our interactions with dogs, then it moves into a different space. So I'd love for you and everybody else to, to kind of like differentiate. So here is stuff that's invasive, touching, petting, hand in the bowl, all this stuff, like kneeling right down next to them. Everybody wants to see like, is my dog good with resource guarding? It's just a shitty thing to do and it's very, has a very high likelihood of causing your dog to become more protective, more uncomfortable around food, and start to associate you with weird stuff around mealtime. And that's not a good thing, because once that association gets strong enough, your dog's like, I don't like you being here, and now I'm gonna growl, and maybe I'm gonna snap, and all that stuff. So you really wanna let that stuff go. Now, if you get into the proactive at letting it go, like, don't do it. And if you get into the proactive stuff, not you, but your dog, where your dog is actually guarding, actually going after you, actually warning for things that are totally benign, that you're not doing anything, then your dog needs to be corrected. Your dog needs to be the out command on e-collar, needs to be really, really, really clearly taught. And your dog needs to be set up in all those different contexts where they're guarding, possessing, growling, getting snarly, whatever and out your dog away from that stuff and get rid of any of that guarding predisposition or guarding mentality or guarding attitude or guarding shittiness and get it gone. And so those would be my two distinctions. So if you're creating it, stop creating it. Just let it go. If your dog's cool, aces. Um, if you are uh, on the receiving end of a possessive resource guarding dog, then go after it and start act actively working on disassembling those, those behaviors and that mindset in order to get your dog into a healthy space to where everybody's safe. And that would be my answer for that. So I think that's it. So.
anything else we want to share? Any important facts, I details? Think we, we talked about all the like you know important. We talked stuff. about my hair. That the most important. Part we talked about my hair. That was that was important. Very um, we covered a lot of information. Yes. Um, the Martingales, the new intern, Ava, the new secret trainer. Yeah, guys, wait till these collars hit though. Mm -hmm. These collars are going to be so great. Yeah. When you have matching collars and leashes, yeah. ooh, you're going to be so cool. Anyways, we're going to get out of here, guys. It's super late. It's going on midnight, and it is time for us to wrap. Yes. So, watching, and we will talk with you guys soon. See you later.